This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person who has an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a dangerous asshole, like driving 90 miles an hour in the 50 zone. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. For this week's show, you'll definitely see that I picked the right guest. Of all the people in the news media, Michael Malice might be the worst citizen of them all. He's a regular guest on The Kennedy Show on Fox Business Network. And if you watch the show, you'll know that he has no problem at all insulting liberals and conservatives right to their face. Michael is a columnist for The Observer, where he takes positions on major issues that most people would consider socially irresponsible. He's also the author of Dear Reader, the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il, in which he adopts the persona of the former supreme leader of North Korea. To me, Michael's most interesting work is the graphic memoir that he co-authored with Harvey Pekar, which is titled, quite appropriately as you'll see, Ego and Hubris. I interviewed Michael in New York City. We talked about his childhood, being raised in a Soviet Jewish totalitarian family, his love of drag queens, the existence of objective truth, and the civil war between people who have gone to college and the people who haven't. I also reveal some of my own dirty secrets. I'm here with a notorious Michael Malice. I'm nervous about this because he's a fairly dangerous guy. It makes me nervous. makes a lot of people nervous. And when I first met him, I, I didn't know what to do with him. He, uh, he hugged me, and it was, uh, it was inappropriate. But I, I kind of like inappropriate people, so it proceeded anyway, and we had a, a decent lunch. Well, anyways, I'm sorry, Michael. Why don't you go ahead and tell the listeners how we got together? Why, why do we know each other? Why is this happening? I, I, who, I could who, say- who are you? Should we be scared? I, I, you shouldn't be. There's nothing to fear but fear itself, as our most famous cripple. I, I love who's that? as our most great. That's so wise. Our most famous cripple once said, um, "I can honestly say that if everyone who I'm friends with, you have influenced my thinking more than anyone else." Oh my god! What which a, is what a fucking brown noser. Okay. I've never you. I've never said that to anyone. I can't even think who number two would be. So we met because I was working on a project with you for Camille. For Freethink Media, Camille, Camille Foster, Foster, the notorious "I don't identify as black" Camille, right? Um, and read your book. It, you know, was kind of like the fountainhead moment because so many disparate elements ahead of my thinking kind of came together. Uh, was and really, did I, you say I, fountainhead moment? You know how kids read the fountainhead. <sighs> you know, I own. Her, I was hoping we wouldn't go there. I own her copy. I, I know you. You more than own it, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Pages are stuck together, <laughs> but not by choice. Um, and you know, when I was in LA, I, I took you out to lunch and it was just great. And it's just, uh, it, it, there's very few people who I think are in our particular ideological box, which is kind of testament to its validity because I'm a Hamiltonian elitist. So if the masses <laughs> like it, it's probably, uh, literally shit. Uh, I can say shit, right? Oh, please. Yeah. Yeah. Why, wait, why and misuse literally? <laughs> why would a Hamiltonian elitist, whatever that is, like it's me, me because you had a clear understanding of how culture is created. Mm-hmm. And Hamilton was Maybe. a piece of crap, oh. low life, degenerate, oh, oh. A b- son of nothing, a bastard brat, as John Adams called him. And he invented America pretty much single handedly. So th- what you talk about 
in your book and, and in your writing is how when you are a marginalized person or group or class, that gives you the social space to be an innovator because you've got less invested in the system. And that's how change happens in a culture. So that is, I think, a very profound uh, point. But did uh, I don't want to talk about Hamilton too much, although guess what I'm doing Wednesday night? His corpse? I'm going to see it. Oh, I've never seen it. I, yeah. I think musicals are an anachronism. I don't like them. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hamilton quickly, then we'll get back to more important stuff. Well, you can see his grave. It's on It's on, it's on. Broadway and Wall Street. Yeah. He died on my birthday. In the tr- Trinity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hamilton changed or marked America not as an immigrant outsider, though. He changed it as a founding father politician, didn't he? Well, he was given a... a Um, what do you call it, a scholarship to Columbia because Mm -hmm. of his brilliance. Mm -hmm. George Washington picked him out of obscurity because he was so impressed with the kid. Um, Jefferson invented the Democratic Party to single-handedly fight Hamilton. So every step of the way in the forming of America, he was there, and he was the one founding father who understood what Thomas Sowell refers to as the constrained vision of humanity, which is that we are, by our nature, limited in what we can change and how we can live as human beings. And unless you account into those limitations, you get things like you know, Marxism and, and leftism at its worst, which is this idea that human beings are malleable. And if the human being doesn't fit the system, it's the human's fault. So let's put them in the meat grinder. So you might call it Hamiltonian humility. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, he was not a very humble person, but in, vis-a-vis... Politically humble. Yes. Right? Y- yes. Which he sort right. of, he um, anticipates Hayek in that way, doesn't he? Well, I, I, th- I don't know about... The knowledge Yes, the, the knowledge, knowledge problem, problem right. Mm-hmm. And, and knowing that, um, you know, finance is what's going to be making America great and not what Jefferson wanted, which for us to be dirt farmers, you know, which is the Marxist vision. Mm-hmm. So I think you're probably wrong about everything uh, so far, but that's okay. We'll get back to this you're later. You're using the word think a little loosely. <laughs> um what I need to do is watch your debate or listen to your de- listen to your debate with Tom Woods. I blew it completely. Who's probably correct on this. I blew it completely <laughs> because I didn't have the timing right. right. So by the time my first opening statement was over, he wasn't even like Treasurer Tre- 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 Treasury. Yeah. Uh, what you cannot deny for Hamilton is authoring the Federalist, having the idea of a codified rights is something that informed the UN Bill mm-hmm. of Rights. And I think that is something that's had such a, pro- it doesn't always work, but it has been such a profound step forward. I mean, people, pe- signatories say, yo, yeah, you have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and then they ignore it. But the fact that this is something that they have to kind of kowtow to is an enormous step forward. You're talking about the UN, the United, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights right. of 1947? Correct. Okay. Wow. Okay. And you like that? I, yeah, of course. I, I, I like that it's something that it has been universally accepted as this is something that we... How, could, how are you shaking your head? You don't like human rights? I don't, is, do, are you, can I see your ID? Are you sure? Uh, you, um, what, what, how can you not be against that? My God. Okay, we'll get back to this later. Let's get back to the more important thing. Okay. Let's get back... Let, not back to... Let's start with... Restart. Let's have a restart. Just like with Russia. You're Russian. I oh, am. Russia. That's where you started. There okay. we go. Soviet Union. I want to start there. Yeah. Soviet I was born Union. Ukraine. So the most important thing to talk about is one's childhood. Uh, sh- sure. Yeah. Because I am at heart a Freudian. Oh God. I know. I can't shake it. It's bad, but I just, I just can't shake it. Uh. And I do think, here you go, that all political expressions are essentially projections of internal psychological drama. Okay. Not, which is not to say that they are invalid. That is not to dismiss any political expression in particular. But I do think that's why we say the things we do about politics. Okay. I think it is an acting out of a drama inside of us that originated most likely, not always, but most likely, usually in childhood. I think our childhoods are so complex and extend so much throughout time. It's very easy to take a political expression and just latch it on to some childhood expression, but correlation is not causation. Absolutely. And that's done way too often and too easily. People, it's a, it's a cheap way to dismiss political opponents, and I hate it when people do that to me. They do it to me all the time. They say I'm acting out an Oedipal struggle with my parents who were leftists, and I hate that. But I, do th- but, but I, I think we can do it in a more... Um, intelligent, sensitive, important, meaningful way. Okay. So one of the, one of my favorite things, one of the things that I've read lately that I liked the most was 
ego and hubris. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. My biography. Yeah. And I want this podcast to be somewhat akin to that. <laughs> I mean, I mean all the episodes in this podcast. Universe I praise. Want, yeah. Uh, oh, well, okay. I had, we had 100% positive reviews. I you personally should. did not, but the book did. I was you, shocked. It should. It's fantastic. Everyone should read that. And I want, I wish our political culture would do more of that. Um, and what that's, this is one of the things I want to do with this podcast okay. is I hate this. I know it's it only because it was misused, but I want to use it anyway to, okay. I'm, mm, to make the political personal and the personal political. I know terrible second that's wave feminist ultimate enemy. I know, but that's I'm going to, exactly I'm going to, what I'm against. Okay. Well, I don't care. You're you're my prisoner. So you're going to do what I say. Okay. I know you like that too. Yeah. Um, you really think I'm a bottom? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> goes without saying so <laughs> sweetie uh, <laughs> all right no let's just can you do you mind doing the story your uh, story i mean i don't mind but what do you mean specifically yeah let's let's start from the beginning because a lot of people won't know it okay who haven't read ego and hubris you were born in ukraine correct which when it was part of the soviet union I was born in, yes so then it would be technically the ukraine Oh, well, there's a whole debate about that. Right. So yeah. it's, a, it's, not a, it's a country, not a region. But back then, I think technically you would say the so Ukraine. When you use the, that denotes what? It's a region. So since it's part of the Soviet Union. No, but there's a political. There's a political. Right. Meaning. Because they're I heard saying. Someone, I heard someone debating about this, about the politics of that. Right. So they're saying we're a country, not a region. When you're saying the, you're referring to it as a region. So they're very nationalist. Okay. So what do you prefer? I am saying technically, I think it's as it when it's part of the Soviet Union and being conquered, it's the Ukraine because it's a part of the Soviet Union. As a country, it's Ukraine. Okay. I don't care about either. I don't speak Ukrainian and I don't identify with it particularly. Okay. So the Russians hated the Jews a little less. So <laughs> Russia, it, whenever you meet someone who's from that area, who's an American, they'll always say they're Russian. They don't say they're so Ukrainian. So you just outed yourself as Jewish, you know? I, yes. It's not a secret. Okay. Kiev? Lvov, which okay. is where mm-hmm. Mises was born. Oh, right. And also the father of masochism. Is that the second biggest? So no. Not I even. Think, I think Odessa is, is up there. Oh, right. Too. That's where my family's from. Oh, cool. The Canningsburgs. Uh, I'm a quarter Jew. Mother's side smart, or father's side? It's the smart part. Mothers. Okay. Yeah. So yes. I'm, that's why I can hang with you. Yes. Uh, I mean, like, compete with you. That's why I, I can be more or less at your level, even though your IQ is 160. I understood um, you that you believe that. Yeah. <laughs> It's tough because it's only a quarter. So, you know, <laughs> I have the three quarter um, mongrel part of me just struggling, drowning, really, in your brilliance. Uh, <laughs> okay. So you're born there. And what, how old were you? Do you mind saying when you were born? 76. All right. Wow. Okay. Um, so you were a Yankee Doodle Dandy soon. Yeah. I can't so when, did you, one, when did you one come? One and a half, two. Oh, okay. So you were, you were, you were but larva. Correct. Came here. Okay. Um, and moved, and your family moved to Brooklyn. I know what part. Uh, we grew. Uh, it was originally Bensonhurst. So that, that's the interesting thing, is Bensonhurst, right? Yes. Yeah. In the seventies. Yeah, late seventies. Why on earth did they choose the Guido capital of the United States? Probably because that's what they could afford. Huh. Uh, it was great growing up in an Italian neighborhood. The mafia was very strong, so they kept the streets safe. But it's odd, right, for uh, certainly an immigrant family to move to a. A neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of their own in it. Brighton Beach was is not far away. Okay. And again, I, I think this was a beggars can't be choosers situation. Hmm. We were very very poor. Like my mom would tell a story of how she'd walk to one store to see how much grapes were, and then walk to the other store to compare pennies. You know, that level because we I don't think they spoke English even. Right. And were they dissidents? Or was this part of the Jewish download? It's uh, part of the Jewish download. thing. Yeah. So basically, <laughs> you say you're going on a trip Upload, to visit guess, yeah. Israel, and you just don't come back. Right. But this is when the Soviets were trying to get rid of the Jews, right? Correct. Yeah, right. And you had to be sponsored, I believe, by an American, right, which right. we were. Yeah. It was an, and does the, Kathy Young was part of that exodus, right? Was I, it, I don't I know. think her family was part of that. Uh, I, I can see it. When they were tossing the Jews out yeah. and making themselves look humanitarian. Correct. Right? Yeah. Win, um, win, win. Right. Okay. So then, so there you are. And Bensonhurst was a, you know, famously Italian working class. Yes. For mob, a long time. Mob run or at least great. dominated yes. neighborhood, certainly then in the 70s, right? Yeah. So when, when Jersey Shore came out, I was like yawning because I'm like, oh, I know all this stuff. I yeah. grew up with this stuff. But like, so you're a, but you're a Russian Jewish immigrant kid yeah. and an egghead. Like, yeah. how on earth did you survive that? There's nothing to survive. I didn't interact with anyone in the neighborhood ever. Ah, I was that's un- how you did. I was, you know, kind of 
uh, my grandma kind of raised me and I went to yeshiva, which is Jewish school, which was not in the neighborhood. Um, and yeah, I was very kind of socially isolated. Hmm. So you just kept to yourself? Well, not by choice, but like, I mean, I had friends in school. So here's the thing. And I've, I recently ran to someone. I went to elementary school. She recognized me from second grade. It was very cool. So when you go to yeshiva, my yeshiva, you have to uh, be practicing. So I had to wear the yarmulke, I had to wear the tefillin, which is like the magic underwear, and so on and so forth. And I, t so when I was in school, this was the pretense. To this day, I don't know if they knew it was just a charade and looked the other way, or they really believed it, because almost no Russian Jews um, were practicing. But then at the same time, I couldn't really have kids come over to my house, because it's not like we're keeping kosher in the house. There's lucky charms everywhere, you know? So uh, the cereal, <laughs> not, not the voodoo. So... That was basically the, the situation. Yeah, it was tough. Hmm. Um, and you, in Ego and Hubris, you describe yourself as being brilliant or knowing, more importantly, that you knew that you were brilliant yes. when you were very, very young. Yes. Um, so I love that in a lot of ways. I did not know if I was particularly intelligent until um, my dissertation defense wow yeah if you're writing a dissertation you're yeah. far above average at already Col at columbia yeah no i did it wasn't until that day that meeting when i had five you know eminent scholars sur surrounding me at this table and talking about this thing i had written um it was it wasn't until then when i found myself that i was actually on top of them yeah i was actually uh, yeah for the first time i felt like i was actually in charge of the conversation and teaching them and they knew less than I did. But until then, really, and that was, I was 33, 4, something like that. I didn't really know wow. I was smart. That's sad. I wasn't sure. I didn't, I, I didn't think I was dumb. But I didn't know where I was between average and exceptional. Um, and we can talk about why. But um, I love that about you, that you don't seem to care whatsoever about humility. Oh, I don't think that's true. Modesty. Uh, well, I, 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 humility and modesty. Oh, I want you. Things. I want you to not care. <laughs> I do care about humility. One. Of the well, those are bourgeois that, values, right, of the nineteenth century. You know, and we talked about Hamilton. I think humility Being, is very. The reason I'm an anarchist is because of humility. Okay. I don't believe in imposing my Sorry. political positions. On oh, that's else. different. That's different. I mean, okay. I mean the idea of oh, false um, humility, like deception. No. Um, so one of the cardinal bourgeois virtues is is modesty. You know that you don't. You don't, you're not self-aggrandizing. You shouldn't be self-aggrandizing. You shouldn't talk about yourself. You shouldn't be boastful. Um, this is why people hate Trump, by the way. This is a, a made, not the only reason, but it's a major reason why people yes. hate Trump. And this is how he sta has always stood apart from other great capitalists, in fact. And this is right. long before he was running for president. I, this was my analysis of Trump, which was that if you look at Carnegie and Rockefeller and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, you know, what do they look like? They look like accountants. They look like middle class accountants. You know, they don't show off at all. You don't know even where they live. They don't seem to enjoy going to big fancy parties. You don't know what car they drive. Trump was just the opposite, right? So he's actually had a very working class culture about right. him, Trump. And the fact that he boasts all the time about himself drives people crazy, right? That's actually... That's very common in working class cultures. But, uh, and yeah. it, runs, it runs counter to the Victorians and the Puritans. Every Russian man is a blowhard. Yeah. But, so the Russians right, run but counter But I to don't that. think me talking about my intelligence is being boastful because I've got the data to back it up. I'm not Trump saying I have the best words. <laughs> and I don't talk about Oh, yeah, but you're not even allowed you, to do that. You, right. But you brought it up is my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're not even allowed to say that. I mean, you're not Correct. even allowed to say anything. You're, you right, you're supposed to demure. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess that would be false modesty. That's what you're yeah. calling false modesty. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I love that. And I love that you knew who you were early on. I didn't, but I knew oh. I was smart. Okay. I did not know who I was. What did, what did you not know? Um, when you grew up in a Soviet household, you're under constant hmm. assault hmm. from your family. Hmm. Constant. So it is... It takes a long time to start deprogramming that stuff and realizing how much programming has been done, you know, subconsciously. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. I just knew, you know, I had some capacity to probably figure it out, uh, which was a long process. I mean, it wasn't easy becoming Michael Malice, I assure you, as mm -hmm. you can imagine. Uh, but having gotten there, it's pretty damn awesome. 
So the book talks about you being under more or less constant control. Yeah. Your parents were attempted. They were I, sort of dragging you along in their lives. Well, right. My mom kind of had this attitude that her kids are like her, her like I was like her dog. Mm-hmm. Not in people have think that's a negative connotation. It's like, no, you love your dog, but the idea that the dog, this metaphor I use, the idea that a dog has, you know, values of its own is just nonsensical. But you describe your household as a Soviet household, not a Russian or Jewish household. Right. So you're, you're suggesting that Soviet ideology and culture had infused the nuclear family. Well, like the idea that in, like I was, the idea that in your family that any, any time you ever showed vulnerability, that would 100% of the time be used as an opportunity to further hurt you. Mm-hmm. 100% of the time, which is a very pernicious lesson. It's me. also very Russian, right? It's not just Soviet. Well, it? I, 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 I mean, I don't know what it's like there now. Yeah. So I'm, I'm speaking, you know, from, I think this, I mean, I think the Soviet gives it the connotation of insanity, uh, which is what I'm going for. And, and, right. and inhumanity. Right. So that was kind of a big part of it. Also, just these kind of uh, the idea that you have to kind of strive hard and that's the way to get ahead, which is an American idea also, which I have contempt for as well as you. Uh, I, I, you have that contempt for that idea as well. Um, yeah, those were just kind of two big things. Like my dad was like really livid, you know, one time when I got like a B, even though going from elementary to junior high was a function of taking a test and going from junior high to high school was a function of taking a test. In both cases, my grades were completely irrelevant. So it, it, it's just this, it, it taught me to have contempt for uh, hard work as a moral <laughs> you know, duty, to which mm. I retain to this day. I, I hate that expression, like, well, I worked hard for this. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I'd rather you be productive. So, you know, I am constantly refusing to identify as libertarian well i don't use that word either i know you don't either yeah Yeah. another thing i like about you um and one of the reasons i don't is that it seems to me i could be wrong it seems to me that many libertarians have internalized the protestant work ethic yes um oh yes that let's define this for the listeners and you do it beautiful and it stunned me when i saw this in in your book this you, and it was published in 2006 so you had not had any encounters with me in any way before you wrote this um you said that i did not have the protestant work ethic as a child um i did not think work in itself was a virtue yes i thought it of it only as a means to achieve one's goals yes yeah wow stunning like i never see that I never see people thinking that. I never see people saying that, uh, except, you know, my students right. after I've taught them this for months and months. Um, wow. So how did that happen? Because this culture, and in particular, the American immigrant culture, pounds that into our heads. But right? I was in a yeshiva, right? And I was, my household was Soviet. So here's an, like, he, like one of the early things, being smart, you realize you're very good at sussing out people who aren't that smart. So I would take tests or have to do homework. And this sounds, maybe there's some kind of autism creeping in here. But as a kid, <laughs> I never understood why it was of value to me to demonstrate to some stupid teacher how much I learned of the, of the work. What do I care what she thought of me? Who cares? You're some dumb lady. Shut up. So that taught me to have no, no you know, interest. And also the fact that I could do the work very easily uh, and get better grades. It's like, so there's no correlation between work and payoff. I mean, these are two things that I learned. I mean, from kindergarten, I remember in first grade to be as lazy as possible. We had vocabulary words, right? So if you had tiger or pen or store, you have to write three sentences with each one. What I would just do is write the tiger bought the pen at the store and underline tiger. And then I'd write it again and write underline pen. And then I write it again, underline store just to do the absolute minimum work. Even though it takes, how much effort does it take to think of three sentences with those three words? Zero. See, the difference between you and me, though, is that you got good grades nonetheless. Oh, yes. I yeah, was... I didn't. Oh. I never got good grades. Ever, oh, yeah. Until college. It, it drove the teachers crazy that I didn't do the homework because I, I was the smartest kid, but I refused to do the work. Right. So there was no reason whatsoever for you to hold the Protestant work ethic. Well, other than threats from home, in a sense... Because it's, it's kind of like, you know, you, if you don't, because my, my dad was just like, don't, don't get into the habit of being lazy, but you which didn't, is fair. What I'm saying is you didn't gain anything at all from work. Correct. At that point, right? Correct. Like, like the slaves. And let me, give, let me give another good example. This was, this, I don't think this is in the book, but this was just, a, Russians are big on gaming systems, you know, which is why I'm, I'm a good troll. <laughs> so we hear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in <laughs> second grade, whoever read the most books got a prize. 
right? So every time you read a book, you brought it in, you got a check mark. And I'm like, all right. So this is about quantity, not quality. So I bought all these kindergarten books, which I could read 10 of a day. And I had more, I, you know, I blew everyone else out of the water. And I'm like, and I won the, whatever the prize was. I don't remember what it was. And I'm like, exactly. This is how you do it, stupid. And no, I, I was shocked that no one else figured out this con. Huh. Uh, yeah, no, I, it just, you managed to see the brilliance. This is what, this is my major frustration in my own life. I, I, if I had known that I was smarter, <laughs> I would have had a, probably a more, a, a biography more similar to yours. Um, no, I suffered. I didn't do well. I never did well. I finished high school with a C average. This is why I hate public education and because I, it makes smart kids think they're dumb. So my son is 15. He's been in public schools, right? This whole time. And this is one of the, I, I didn't quite know this until I saw him in these schools that public school teachers, I'm sorry if you're listening and you're one of them, but you know, overwhelmingly they are vermin. mediocre vermin. at best vermin. No, they <laughs> mediocre at best. They are corrections officers in prisons for yeah. children. I agree. I totally they agree. Are I don't, you know, now none filth. of them will, have ever have thought that about themselves. So you have to, you have to approach these people more carefully. I don't have Michael. to approach them at all. They can go <laughs> fuck off. They are shit. Oh God. I know. I agree with you. Disgusting human beings. I know. I That's... think about them the way Chuck D thinks about the police. They are taking children's minds and breaking them and making them obedient to our stupid government and our, and the worst aspects of our culture. They are the worst people with few exceptions, very few. And those few have to be broken by the, uh, you know, the culture as well. Okay, pretend that I am Mr. Lee, my son's first grade teacher at PS321 in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Okay. Very sweet, I mean, we all thought at the time, very sweet, middle-aged gay man who, you know, seemed to care about the kids and the kids liked him. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't I didn't see a tremendous amount of op oppression going on okay. in that classroom. I liked the guy. I talked to him a few times. You know, it, it, I did not think he was the smartest person I'd ever of met. Not. But I thought he was kind and decent. Did you see Norm Macdonald's bit about this? Uh -uh. He's like, congratulations, you're smarter than for a room full of first graders. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's give us the analysis about why he's um, vermin. Well, I can't speak on him personally. That's not fair. Well, you did. I'm you just... grouped them together, didn't you? Sure. Didn't you say they're all vermin? They, they all have to be put up against the wall, they're, but some have to be shot before well, others. So that's Mr. Lee inc is included. You, so. if, if you don't think that uh, there's a certain like gay... Meaning, meaning no matter how nice they are, right, they are serving a particular function in our society, right? Yeah, iron fist in the you consider... Glove. Do you use the word evil? Do you yes. believe in that category? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I don't, but that's okay. So tell us why. Because their whole job... I don't remember if this started with Dewey... But the whole point of progressive public education is to make people into good citizens. It's not to make them educated. Good citizens is code for obedient and submissive and docile. And, that is, and it's exactly the people who refuse to be obedient, submissive, and docile who make America great and who make other countries great. So their whole job is to stamp out creativity where it, it, it is formed in young, intelligent, great minds at the most point where it's it's most vulnerable so they are awful now there are few who like realize wait a minute uh, you know i'm i'm kind of a you know one of the good guys but the, all the odds are against them and and if they had any kind of intellect at all they would be you know authors or speakers or or, or writing books or something like that mm -hmm. Just um the worst. well yeah so we can broaden it too i mean we can say that you know education in this country is compulsory Correct. People actually aren't aware of that. I, mean, I think they are. I don't think so. I think if you ask them, they, it, it, well, I would say that or, it doesn't occur they, to them. Right. They're like, why wouldn't you want to go it's to not, school? Yeah, it's not conscious. Right. It's not, you know, they never register that fact. Right. I didn't register that fact until, I have to say, I think maybe when my son was in school. Isn't it curious that we're taught how to calculate the dew point and different points of clouds, but we're not taught logical fallacies? Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, it's compulsory. Like, if I don't, put my son in school somehow that's you know authorized by the state i go to prison but it's also the thing if your son doesn't have the diploma it's a credentialist society sure so he's screwed right yeah and by the way you know some fascinating stuff i heard george packer i need to read this article george packer the new yorker liberal idiot writer um 
wrote an article about, nonetheless, it sounded interesting and useful. I heard him on Terry Gross, another idiot liberal, um, about how the important legacy of the Clinton years was that they, and I didn't really know this, they really pushed hard at creating more and more and more college students. Yes. This whole generation of college students, right? And that is the divide that Packer sees. And I, I think he's right about this. That really played out in the election. The divide between yes. those of college, you know, the culture, the access, the way of being, all the things that are associated with with it, and those who have not been. So Harvey Who are not of college. Harvey Pekar, who wrote Ego and Hubris, he would talk about this all the time. Yeah. He's like, that's the real big divide. I'm reading a book by yeah. my buddy Jim Goad, The Redneck Manifesto. Yeah. He talks about that extensively. Yeah. And I think uh, college urban whites, who are the, the worst uh, socioeconomic class in this country, they <laughs> don't get it. And they would rather have it be about race than about class and they're because they're the oppressive class. It's a good thing you don't live in Brooklyn. <laughs> mm. Right. So, and then, so these public schools also are, you know, these tunnels. <laughs> yes. At one end, one end of them is college. Meat grinders. Right. Yes. The, the front end of the tunnel is when the little five-year-olds come into kindergarten class on the first day and they make them, what do they do? Get in line. Well, you know what else they do? It's not who, it doesn't matter who started it. The basic premise of any fight is the person who started it is wrong. You don't get to lay your hands on anyone else. And that teacher doesn't want the facts. It doesn't matter who started it. Fuck you. That's all that matters. What? Oh, who started? Oh, this is, are you, are you? Like in a fight. This is a non-aggression principle thing? Yeah. Oh. But it's also a justice thing. You, you, you don't start nothing, there won't be nothing. Go apologize. Who how the fuck are you to tell me I'm oh, sorry? Oh, they teach us that it doesn't matter who started yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go apologize. Yeah. See, my thing is it doesn't matter who started it. I just want to win. <laughs> well, yeah, that's but, fair. But anyway. Uh, uh, but I, I, don't, I won't start it. Yeah. yeah. I'll finish it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, no, I believe in fighting in every way. It's another way in which, you know. So this is another bourgeois virtue that's never talked about. Even scholars of bourgeois morality um random spontaneous street level popular violence small scale individual violence became taboo right in the 19th century right, right. not okay right large scale organized industrial violence yeah. industrial it doesn't have to yeah industrialized um military violence of course is necessary and admirable for a while and admirable and you're the greatest american yeah. if you participate in that i support our tropes oh, and the greatest soviet and the greatest german and the greatest right. all the rest of right. it. yeah um yeah I, I would encourage everyone to read this poem called a uh, rendezvous with death which is from during the first world war and also f uh, on flanders fields and you read these poems and they're these 19 year old kids out of ivy league and they are desperate to die in war mm -hmm. And you read it and you just want to kill yourself because it's you want to cry because it's like these children have been taught there's nothing more admirable than just dying for no reason at that age. It's just it's horrifying. Yeah. And I think it's true that that is generally a middle class and upper class phenomenon. Oh, yeah. And it's faded away. Yeah. Thank God. Because yeah. now the, the lower classes tend to yeah, be more of the military. The Petraeuses now are rarer, more and more rare. Yes. Right. In fact, well, even Petraeus is not a Petraeus. Right. Um uh, was he, did he serve in combat? Was he I don't, ever I combat? Don't know. Yeah. I don't even think. Right. I mean, you never hear about the Teddy Roosevelt of today, Correct. right? The upper, the scion of the upper right. class. Right. Exactly. Manhattan family who volunteers to go fight, you know, in battle. Well, McCain, in, McCain's sons all enlisted and they saw, oh, they saw tours. And combat. Yeah. Oh, you know who did? Um, Prince Harry. Yeah. There's another one. There yeah. So I think he was actually in combat, right? Yeah. Like it was in a helicopter. Yeah. Um, I, I, when he did that, when Harry volunteered for that i said god bless you go, well, was, go he for the, it wasn't he the one who wore the swastika too yeah one of them did so i think it was the, him yeah. it was the, the bad badass. the bad yeah, yeah. the so-called bad one you yeah, know i loved it i said please more princes yes volunteering for combat um anyway back to school um so yeah i hated every single minute from the first minute of kindergarten to the last minute of 12th grade uh, oh i didn't hate it as much as you did at all. oh really no i had fun sometimes Oh, because you were sort of the trickster and you got away with it and you still got good grades. And also I was... The so you didn't have the anxiety that I had. I had all this tremendous anxiety about not getting into college. Oh, no, no, no. I had anxiety at home. Right. Um, 
and I had anxiety about school because like I didn't do the work, I'd be waiting for the other shoe to drop, you mm -hmm. know. So that was a, a, a big procrastinator. That was a big problem. Um, but like in fifth grade, I was the first kid from my school to ever win the spelling bee, and they had a day in my honor, that kind of thing. A so, day in your honor? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah, you see, you took it over. I didn't do that. I was just yeah. I was like, I just let myself get run over oh, by no, it. No. It was fun. Yeah. It, it's, it's very easy to outwit most people because they don't think in those terms. And was this, so, oh, right. And so you were in yeshiva school until fourth, fourth grade, grade. And yeah. then you went to a, public pub, a regular public school. Yeah. Which one, where? Uh, PS312 um, in Bath Beach, Brooklyn. Which Bath Beach? Oh, that's... It's like Far East. It's like uh, the trains don't go there. What's it next to? Um, it's next to Canarsie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's, it's, yeah. A, it's, wow. a, it's more upscale. Uh, then I went to, Stuy to Huddy, which was this magnet program okay. uh, for junior high. And then, of course, Stuyvesant. So, you, right, you did school. go to Stuy. Yeah, I, oh, yeah. I thought so. I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah. right. That um, was great. And that was great. Yeah. And it that was, was great being around other smart kids. And yeah. same thing with junior high. It was all smart kids. Uh -huh. We were kind of segregating our own corridor. We weren't allowed. The other so, go. Um, you, I mean, you felt... Uh, alienated from everyone until then like you, one of the most um poignant themes in the book ego and hu hubris still um was your very frank talk about your feelings about your parents yes yeah uh, another thing i just adore about you okay. and which sets you apart from 99.999 percent of americans we are not allowed and you actually point this out in the book we are not allowed to say things about our parents like this, right. you know, that your mother was stupid. You yeah. said this, right? Uh, the, all the bad things your father did, you know, he s took money from your mother and he said mean things to you. And Oh, yes. Uh, God, it's amazing. I mean, it's so the nuclear family, you know, is something we as a culture need to talk much more about. Well, it's kind of an extended family because my grandparents were there, but my, both my parents were only children, which kind of adds to my point. Yeah, that's the immigrant yeah. kind of inflection you right. had. But, you know, there's still, it seemed to me, I don't know, it's your family, I don't know, but it seemed like the nuclear family was still sort of the dominant sure. Sure. structure there. That's fair. Um, it's, it can be, and, and the way you describe it, it's like a prison. Yeah. It was a prison for you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a prison for everyone, the way that. The just the in very it's much the not. way that public schools are it's not the nuclear family it's not there's a lot of people who say sincerely my mom's my best friend and they mean it and more power to them i think that's wonderful well a lot of people say that about their um high school teachers too well th that's idiocy because you're only going to wow. talk to that person for four years your mom a lot of people have supportive moms who love them for but, them. come on but if you're poor you don't get to choose your teachers or your schools sure and no one gets to choose their family Sure. And some people well, get the luck of the draw. So there it becomes a little bit of a prison. So it could be a nice prison. It could be like a, a minimum security Norwegian prison. Right? I don't, I don't, I'm Which not is going down you, this road. You it love has, your, you love the warden. No, you have negative, prison has negative connotations. I know. I don't think, <laughs> I don't agree that nuclear family is necessarily a prison at all. See, I think we need to, I think we would all be happier if we move toward the extended family communal. Oh God. See, this is the family. Hamiltonian stuff. This is what Com you, communal what, child raising. Model. Chesterton, who I hate, Which, once said, before you tear down a fence, make sure you know why it was built. Something like that. I'm paraphrasing him. So this is one of those, this is one of those things communal. where... You're not going to talk to someone who came from the Soviet Union about communal anything. Not communal in that sense. Not, in any not, sense. Not the, not the compulsory state-run sense. Doesn't matter. No. I mean, so I think this is one of those things where we have something to learn from the slaves. Okay. Because that was their model. You know, right. it was the whole... The slave... I don't like right. this word either, but the slave community, the people who happen, yeah. happen to be living in that place, you know, not, this is by, not by choice, but you know, they happen to be there with poor groups that you kind of have to have this. The kind children of were raised yep. by everyone. Yes. So yes. You everyone still see this in areas in proximity. Yes. Yes. Right. And yes. so you still see this in most of the world. In fact, yes. in fact, the nuclear family is as far as I know, pretty much exclusive to Europe and America. Uh, although, and anyone who's a conservative who says that the nuclear family is like has biblical roots is should be shot in the face. Right, and that's their claim. They honestly yeah. think this. So wait, I'm now I'm confused. What is your position on the nuclear family? Are you with me or not? I think it it could be wonderful or it could be terrible. Oh. I, okay, sure. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to say it's never going to work, but the the point is that we have a nuclear family ethic. Correct. Right. That we use a lot of shame yes. and we say that if you're if you're not a part of a nuclear family right. there's going to be something wrong with you right that is like I'm michael malice against. yes right 
Um, and what I say is that if you're part of a nuclear family, you're more likely to become a Michael Malice, which is you stop talking to your family, right? Yes. Um, I don't think a lot of you, people have the you, balls to do that. And you talk, I well, know no, it's another way in which you're unusual in a great way, but um, you, and you talk about how you repressed your dark negative feelings about your parents because you were supposed to Correct. repress them. Yeah. Correct. And what happens to repression? Freud said it returns as something darker and more dangerous, right? <clears throat> like you. <laughs> Dark. I'm a modern day Wesley Snipes. <laughs> well, in a way, you are. I mean, you are a threat to our society. Oh yes. No, I mean that. So oh, one of yes. the things that I, I mean it too. One of the things that just really hit me, and I've thought this before, but as, with you, it's really stark. Um, is that? Can I just make one point? Yeah. Mike Wallace interviewed Rand in '59, I think it was, and he goes, "Ayn Rand." Yeah, Ayn yeah. Rand. He goes, uh, "Mike Wallace of CBS." Sixty he, minutes. He says, yeah. "You know, you are against." All of our traditions, our government-regulated capitalism, a rule of majority will. Other reviewers say you're, you're out to destroy our American way of life and scorn churches and the concept of God. Are these accurate criticisms? And she goes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, no, what occurred to me, it really stood out reading your autobiography. You co-wrote that with people. Well, I wrote two Word documents and Harvey adapted it into a reference. I mean, it novel. reads like your... Yeah, but those are my yeah. words. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, is that... According to not just the American Psychological um, Association, and Amer but also just American culture broadly, you would absolutely definitively be um, categorized as a sociopath. Well, well, shit. No, no, no. But no, but I'm saying by the, look up the definition of sociopathy. No, I don't have imp I don't have poor impulse control. That's a big one. No. I don't have lack of remorse. Well, okay. The di dictionary definition of sociopathy. No, you ju you're switching. You're, now you're doing a shell game. Okay. You just said according to the, that organization. I'm not putting you down. I'm complimenting you. That's not a compliment at all. Oh, okay. All right. All right. And you sociopaths have nothing to repress. Well, okay. I get, okay, you're right. I did. I did switch out the de dictionary definition. Yeah. yeah okay. Dictionary def You know what definition of sociopath is? The, the last guy who broke up with you. Well, it doesn't it just women. mean... I mean, I thought... I always thought it just meant someone who... I, I think it's used to mean someone who doesn't follow social norms. No, it's never used to mean that. It means someone who's incapable of emotion and does, has disregard for other people's feelings. Well, I, I've heard both. Okay. What I want to say, of course, if you know anything about me and my work, is that someone who doesn't follow social norms is probably a, a good and useful person. Which I am. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. No, I, it's yes. a compliment. I'm well, complimenting you, you. I'm not putting you, it down. If you started with a definition instead of a sociopath. Well, I like to, you know take a different angle on okay. things. I'd like uh, to use words I, I, incorrectly. The American Psychological Association is not my favorite organization. Um, all right, so you're not a sociopath. You were an individualist early on. Iconoclast, yeah. Also unusual to be... You seem to be aware of that when you were a child. Yes. Right? Oh, very much so. Yeah, that's unusual. Yes. Um, I, think I, I think now that I'm talking, I think I had a lot more self-awareness as a kid than uh, most kids do. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. How old were you when you wrote that book? Uh, 30, 29, oh, yeah, 29. Yeah. So you're far enough away from childhood to yes. have a perspective on it. Um, so how did that become political? Right? Your individual, your, your, oh, I'll tell you exactly the individualism how. of your childhood. How did it become political? Oh, this, this is actually a really funny story. Good. So when I was in second grade, the only person, you know, we all need our role models. So the only person who I can relate to on television was Alex P. Keaton, who was Michael J. Fox's character on Family Ties. Because he looked like me, he was like my size, and he was smarter than everybody. And I couldn't watch the show because I resented how they made a clown out of him. So in second grade, I had an attache case, uh, looking adorable as hell, I'm sure. <laughs> and I, under I found that by rattling off these right-wing talking points, it would drive people into apoplexy with minimal effort, which is, of course, my porn. So when I was in a high school, a friend of mine gave me one of Rush Limbaugh's books to read. And Rush Limbaugh is a punk because he, his whole job is to, back then especially, much more less now, was to give a finger to this kind of like progressive consensus and just was really obnoxious and in your face about it. And people were much more offended by his tone than what he actually said, which is pretty much straight Republican boilerplate stuff. Then when I was in college, I had my Rand moment. And after that, you go down the memory hole, you know, uh, the rabbit hole, excuse me. 
And all that, and once Bush and the Republicans had uh, Congress and the White House, and I saw what an abomination it was, that was my last bit of any kind of hope for the Republican Party. So you went to Bucknell. Oh, yes. And you were, were you the president of the conservative club? The, the president of college Republicans. College Republicans. Oh, Republicans. Yes, college okay. Republicans. Newt Gingrich came. I, I got Bill Buckley to sign my copy of Atlas Shrugged. And at that... Okay, so at that moment, though, you identified as a Republican. Your politics were sort of mainstream Republican. Is that no, right? it was far right Republicanism, and it was really great because that was '94 when the Republicans took Congress, and everyone in, in my school was having meltdowns, and it was hilarious. But it also showed me such contempt for I'd never met white people before coming from New York, right? And they now, so, now I know what that means, but you need to explain that for I our, mean for our flyover listeners middle class and upper middle class bourgeois whites like who are non New Yorkers right they had such contempt for any kind of and here's the exact story which gives you the mentality I was hanging out with a buddy of mine and his friend and I said let's play would you rather and as you know Thad would you rather is a game when you're given two horrible choices which are roughly equal in weight and you have to pick one or the other and it's hard because they're both horrible but they have to be equally horrible it's hard to make them equally horrible so I said would you rather be morbidly obese for the rest of your life or be in the middle of a human centipede for a month. Um, and a human centipede is where your mouth is tied to the anus of the person in front of you, and your anus is tied to the mouth of the person behind you. And the guy looks at me, and I'll never forget his accent. Neither. What kind of game is this? Give me some good choices. And I stared at him. I'm like, it's not called Wouldn't It Be Great, right? And I'm like, this is what they're all like. These are the games you play. This is what your wife looks like. This is the music you listen to. This is what your house looks like. Anything outside of this is gross and weird and get it away from me. And these are the same people who in the 80s would be telling you, you're eating raw fish. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with you? And now <laughs> we'll opine about how they're foodies and they're between Japanese mackerel and Spanish mackerel. Right. So they are incapable of critical thought, especially culturally. And they are uncomfortable with anything that in any way is a change agent. Bucknell is a little bit different than most elite yes, liberal arts colleges. Yes, it's the second whitest East, school East in America Coast when I went. Uh, yeah. liberal arts colleges, right? In that, I mean, the reputation, I don't know if this is correct, but the reputation is that it is mostly suburban kids. It's a country club school. Who are not terribly bright. No, they're bright. They're very hard working. Or intellectual. I mean, not intellectual. They're not, correct, that's not, fair. They're not academically... They're not interested in academics. But they were, I mean, they all go on to do well. Right. Make money. In corporate, yeah. In yeah, corporate yeah, America. Yeah, corporate right. drones, yeah. Right. But you don't, you know, the sort of, um, the notorious PC left doesn't seem to actually have much of a foothold there. I mean, it's there, but it doesn't it seem to It has a dumb. very whole, strong foothold there well, because social conservatives are, are have bent over to progressives. So it's an extremely strong Let me back that up. There. Let me back that The PC left is strong on every campus, but I mean, at Bucknell, I, I would say relatively less. They so. just had a thing with Milo in the last year. They almost drove him out of school. Yeah, but how many people was that? I don't know. Okay. So Bucknell, though, the what, I meant, what I meant to say is Bucknell, is its reputation is that it is relatively conservative. But the, Relative to other liberal arts colleges on the East Coast. No? The, conservatism is not... A, Conservatism is just slow motion progressivism. So these people are not going to be, you know, fighting any of this at all. Right. So it was incredibly frustrating. They're just as they're at least the leftists have principles that they're fighting for. Yeah. What it, what's slow motion progressivism? Meaning you have the exact same ideas, but you're just going to take your time implementing them. Which, so it's, which is which are what? What, uh, what are the ideas? The progressivism. Yeah. I mean, whatever. I mean, come on, we've got 70 years of this. I mean, whatever you want. Why not? But be. so tell, I mean, what's, how do you see a similarity between progressivism and conservatism? Because everything that conservatism preaches is what progressivism was preaching is the median 30 years ago. Now, when you're talking about conservatism, you're talking about Republican Party post 1970, yeah. post Reagan. No, do we? I mean, Eisenhower? Oh, Okay, so I would say anything you're not talking over. about. You're not talking about classical conservatism Correct. of Edmund Burke, et cetera, right? Right. Okay. Uh, Who I also don't like, but whatever. Yeah, That's yeah. A separate issue. But don't we like him more? I I don't know. I, I, I do. Okay. I do. I'm not a conservative, of course, but I do like Burke. Um, and I respect them. And I respect, I respect those conservatives. I mean, now they're called paleo conservatives, right? Okay. That's what we're talking. Yeah. Well, I think paleo is not necessarily Edmund Burke, even though he's, he's he historically uh, would be paleo because right. he's old school. Well, they also the paleos. Um, adopted some racialism right. along the way, yes. you know, post Burke. I mean, I don't know. I don't think Burke had that stuff. No, he was before that, Correct. before yeah. scientific racism became a thing. Um, 
So anyway, all right. So you were so you when you get to when you get to Bucknell, you consider your you considered yourself a far right Republican. What did that mean then? That's not Rush Limbaugh. That who was that? It was I, I mean it was like Rand. It was kind of abolished the federal government. Libertarian uh, ish ish. You okay. know, like the, the government shutdown was the best thing ever. Let's put Clinton in prison. Uh, did you like Gingrich? Yeah, I okay. liked him because he was so obnoxious. Right. And okay. he made them so angry. So you, it seems like... And I met him. He came to Bucknell, yeah. Wow. So you, <laughs> Big pumpkin Did you head. see what he said about the press recently? It was what? A couple days ago. I, I'm not sure what he meant, but if he meant what it sounded like, um, it was fascist, which was that Trump should shut down the media. Oh, yeah. I'm all for it. I that. think he used the words shut down. And yeah. I thought... Well, uh, did he mean shut down, like like sh- like shoot them, like meaning get them to shut? Well, up? I don't know. It sounded like he meant like shut, close the doors, and put the cops around the building. But okay, I don't know what he meant. Anyway, why would they stop outside? Just get them in there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. The beatings will continue until headlines improve. So you you had no um, contact with libertarianism when you started at Bucknell. Well, no. I someone left a copy i don't know who it was in in the student hall of laissez-faire books catalog with andrea rich on the back cover you know kneeling on a stack of books uh and i got a lot of book- bucknell's a great library so i read voraciously so that was my kind of contact and it was much more coherent than this kind of pro-life you know medicare and medicaid are great but everything else is bad it's just like which is it right yeah a very strange coalition yes and I, even though I am a professional historian who has studied this very question and read many, many books on this very question, I still don't know exactly why it happened and why it has remained coherent right. until this moment. Now it's about to break apart. But my goodness, it's a, it quite a coalition. Anyway, so, and you had not read Ayn Rand yet? Yeah, I read her freshman year Freshman in college, year yeah. is when this happened. So this is all, before then, you were sort of, quote, right wing, because no, I was it just pissed when, uh, people off. Right. I was just a provocateur. You were a provocateur. Yes. Yeah, right. Um, and you accept that you were just a provocateur, right? Right. And, but then it sounds like when you were in college, you became sort of part provocateur, because right. that seemed to be a part of your politics. Oh, yes. You I mean, enjoyed poking yes. progressivism, right? Well, just, and also the right. I enjoyed poking mm-hmm. the right when they were The weak. establishment. Yes. Right. On both sides. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then you read Rain, Ayn Rand. Yeah. And I've, I have never read a word of Ayn Rand. Oh, really? Not a word. Wow. I, one of the things, one of the reasons Have I, you watched her on Donahue? Maybe. You'd remember. Maybe I watched a little of that. You'd remember. It's baller. So, <laughs> so one of the reasons I had some trepidation about you was the Ayn Rand thing. Okay. So well, I, don't, I don't usually talk about it because for a yeah. certain percentage of the population, higher than 10%, but less than 50, saying you like Rand is equivalent to saying you're into dynamics. I know. I know. And I have to I admit, and I'm not proud of this, but I internalize that. Um, so Rand doesn't have all the answers, but she has all the questions, and she teaches people to think critically and to challenge everything, and that is extremely useful I, for young people. Right. And I've also had bad experiences with randians oh they're horrible except for you i mean they're so, horrible i wouldn't call myself a randian but yeah they're horrible the guy what's his face yaron brook yeah who runs the rand institute, rand institute yeah he's terrible i yeah. don't like him at all i mean of course i agree with him on a lot of stuff but he's terrible on like israel and foreign policy and he's just i don't like the attitude and the style and the well so all right the thing so i don't know but it seemed to me that Rand. i could be wrong disabuse me if i'm wrong that rand and randians had sort of a a worship of the great capitalists is this true uh n- an uncritical no she, i think it worship. was more like kind of like you, you've been fed a pack a lot not she, her great capitalists are mythical so in her characters so there's not i don't think there's a single great capitalist that she's like this person's the best person ever but what's the guy what's the main hero's name in the what's the famous i don't know what's his name the big capitalist in whatever the book is that everybody reads Oh, but he's not a capitalist, so you're, I don't want to give away the ending. But, so, like the but her- she makes, doesn't she, in her novels, doesn't she make the capitalists into these, you said mythic heroes. No, so basically the protagonist of Atlas Shrugged, there's two, Hank Reardon and Dagny Taggart. And, she, you know, Dagny is this ball-busting woman who runs a railroad. Hank Reardon is, you know, invents a new kind of metal. So they're, you know, uh, the heroes of the book. Um, and it's actually really a book about good guys versus other good guys, as opposed to good guys versus bad guys. So it's, so I think to, for her to say that she thought Rockefeller is the best thing ever is false. Okay. So she was very much creating her own mythology as opposed to saying, you know, E.H. Harriman is flawless. 
she ne- that's why one of the big criticisms of her is that people like this don't exist. And her answer to that is the fact that it's been written and published proves that that's false. She didn't say, well, what about, you know, this guy or what about that guy? So she was not uncritical. Correct. Of Cap- You're saying that. Because, okay. you know, Rothbard, is, you know, Rothbard on the other, sort of the other side Correct. of this, right? He was very critical of the big capitalists yes. for being corporatists, for being right. always, for right. using the state she said for their own interests. She said explicitly, the worst of all economic phenomenon, phenomena is the statist businessman. Oh. Verbatim, that's her quote. So then why did they hate each other so much? Well, Roth- Rothbard, and Rothbard is an asshole who got along poorly with everybody. Remember? He burned every single bridge, then he burned those rivers. He, got, he, he left Cato, burned those bridges. He burned the bridges of Buchanan. He burned bridges with Rand. So it, he wasn't burned difference, left. it wasn't a principal difference. I think there was a... He didn't like the vibe around her, what he called her cult, and but, that's fine. Well, that's a vibe, not a principle. Correct. So well, I mean, you, the principle could be like, from his perspective, it would be like you're imposing orthodoxy. From her perspective is everything I'm saying is true. Go fuck yourself. So, I mean, it, it's, it could be a little both, one or the other. But the point is... The, to me, the fact that he did not know how to get along with anyone throughout his life is a problem. And that he publicly went after his own is completely unacceptable to me. Right. I mean, so I, I've read only a little bit of Rothbard, but I, I know a whole bunch of Rothbardians. Yeah. So they tend to be my my friends, the people I know in libertarian circles, you know, they tend to be of the Rothbard ilk. Yeah, same here. You're like the only one I know who's a Randian. That, oh. that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and, but I, so when I've had, when I've had run-ins with Randians, they've been unpleasant. And I had a, well, I, I have to say I had a, I had a pleasant, it was pleasant, but a debate with a Randian about this objectivism yeah. business. Yeah. Yeah. I, it does not, <laughs> well, I just think it's silly, but um, let's do that for a minute. Okay. Let's talk about it and then we'll get on to something more interesting. Okay. Uh, <laughs> although it's actually fundamentally important. Do you want to do this? You want to talk about objectivism sure. for a minute? Okay, so just tell us what it is. Uh, Ayn Rand was once challenged if she could identify the fundamentals of her philosophy while standing on one foot, and she did. And the, what she said was as follows: um, metaphysics, objective reality, that there is one universe, the universe which we perceive. Uh, epistemology, how do we know things, is through reason. Um, ethics is through productive work uh, and and selfishness and. Uh, politics is laissez-faire capitalism. So that's her objectivism in a nutshell. Yep. So I could do the accent, but I won't. Yeah. So she, she believed in objective truth. Oh yes. Right. And uh, that we are capable and, of, of finding it. Right. And, through through and, our minds. And you're with her on that? Yes. hundred percent. Wow. Okay. <sighs> so. Oh, that progressive sigh. I know. Ah, <sighs> let's sigh. What I'm going to say is... Are we... 2017, so how what are we I'm having gonna, this conversation? What I'm going to start doing now is saying, right? <laughs> <laughs> so my brother, Michael. <laughs> right? I found, my, I found myself doing that at times, and I, and I listened to it back, and I want to <laughs> shoot myself right between the eyes. Right? Uh, so, the, so the table in front of us... Do you, is it a platonic idea that there's like that this that this table has one true meaning? Well, no. Her point is that Plat- her arch enemy is Plato. That and she actually said in her typical understated prose that Immanuel Kant is the most evil man who ever lived. Right. Um, so this table exists is not objective. Is is a is a fact. I don't know if it's the same thing as a truth. It's just a data point. It exists. Yes. Outside of human consciousness. Correct. It is independent of human consciousness. Right. Be- yeah. yeah. Existence exists is one of her, co- her quotes. And, and one of her big fallacies, she says, is when people think consciousness precedes existence. Yeah. I, so I think that's silly. Okay. Um, let's well, see. then, how do I do we, this? Why don't we take the table in your head <laughs> and we'll see how silly it is? Right. But yeah. So if, right. So I refute it thus, right? Let's do that. Bishop yeah, so, Berkeley. So if you took this table, it's small enough for, ha- for Michael to handle it, by the way. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> and hit me in the head with it. Uh, is there only one way in which I would perceive that? In, in which you would perceive yeah. it? Correct. So we're not going to perceive is? it in the same way. Correct. No, I would perceive what happened. In I the, think there's only the table one. Itself. Are you perceiving my action or the table? What I'm saying you? I'm. You pick it up, hit me in the head. There's only one way I would perceive that my a, action? A, event. Yeah. N- no, you can think it's a joke. You could think it's an aggression. What do you mean? No, no. Forget the the thing. Um, That's not perception. My senses. That's sensation. 
Oh, okay. So sensation yeah. is physiological, perception is mental. Awesome. Okay. So sensations are, that is um, not conscious. Correct. And not voluntary. Right. right. So we ascribe ideas to the sensations. Well, correct. no, we an analyze our sensations using logic to deduce information. Hold on. So I'm reading a book. Mm -hmm. It squiggles on a page, right? It's mm -hmm. sensations. Things coming into your eyeballs, right. through your eyeballs, right? right? And, and then once they get into your brain, right. then your brain does something with Correct. the sensations. Correct. First, it reads yeah. the words, and mm -hmm. then uh, for the step removed is it takes the ideas. Well, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so, but is there only one way to think about the sensations? Is there only one? No, there's many ways. How many? Reason's infinite. Reason so is the, fallible. So the thing that a lot of people would call pain, right, when you hit me in the head? Right, that's a sensation. Is there only... Well, it's it's physiological, no, but that no pain is an idea. No, it's a word. Pain is, it's pain a, is a word. It's a concept. It's an well, idea. English is is a loose language, and you know that when you but, say like when she left me, I was feeling more pain than but any that's time my, in my life. You're proving my point. Pain is a concept, is it not? Every word is a concept. That's what language is. Correct. I'm trying not to use the word right. Correct. Uh, so that's something that human beings created. Human beings created pain. How the come word, can feel the it? word and the concept of pain, not the sensation, only, which you agreed could be interpreted only human in beings, many ways. Only human beings are capable of co thinking conceptually correct. We didn't invent how many. We ways, didn't invent the concept. So this, we codified okay, it. Let's start over. The sensation that travels through my skull after you hit me. Right. right. How many ways can that be interpreted? Infinitely. Oh. So then, what's true? What's true. What's is object? What's an object? What is the objective fact then? If it can be interpreted infinitely, the objective fact is I hit you in the head with the table. The action can't before the pain happens. The action that you took to cause the pain that can't be interpreted infinitely either. It can. Oh well, then. So but then what's an objective fact about that? Because, what I just said. Now the interpretation. You said are, I could be inter I can interpret that in many ways. Yeah, infinitely. You can, you can interpret why. You can interpret who I am. You can interpret. No, even what, what happened. Yeah, but why is part of what happened? Sure. That's the interpretation. So if all these things in this chain of events can be interpreted infinitely, mm -hmm. where is there an objective fact? The correct answer. Which, <laughs> which is the objective what? fact is in reality. That's where the which correct is fact what? is. Which is what? What's the objective? Name one objective fact in that chain of events. I hit you in the head with the table. No, but you said that could be interpreted in infinitely. It can be, but that is an objective fa facts are open to oh, interpretation. Oh, so then are you saying that there are some interpretations that are more correct than others? No, I'm saying that you, facts are open to interpretation. What they, facts have meaning. For example, if, if it's a fact that we have a constitution in this country, what that means in practice has infinite applications. I'm either I'm missing something or you're completely contradicting objectivism. I, I'm I have I'm not here to defend objectivism. I'm not an objectivist. Oh, you're not. No. Oh, that's the problem. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, you don't agree with this. I'm an anarchist. Wait, no, I agree with what I'm saying. I don't know what she would say. I'm just speaking for myself. I agree with everything I'm saying. I'm not I'm not putting words in her mouth. You do think there's an objective fact there. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. So you are an objectivist. But everything That's you're saying not say, what but, objectivism but, means. But when you say that everything could be everything can be interpreted infinitely. Right. Are you not contradicting? No, because most the of, idea, many of those interpretations are wrong. In fact, all of them except for one. Oh, they're all Oh, they okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's okay. So so all of them are wrong except for one. Right. Or there's no you could have a little probability you, smear. There could be a mix. Okay. For example, it could be I hit you cuz I'm angry and I'm trying to be funny. You know what I mean? It's not always like literally yeah. Uh, so I can I can misinterpret my own experience. We all can constantly. Right. We can't help it. So this there is, is one the there's big one correct. This is the, Do you see where you're going, Michael? No, this is the big problem with Rand. You're going in you're going to a very bad place politically. Okay. This is where Rand is wrong. Because she insisted that human beings are blank slates, right? And my point is uh, a confirmation bias, cognitive dissonance. There are so many tricks that our mind plays on the interpretation process that this is why I'm an anarchist. I am not in a position to impose my worldview on anyone else. But, Be because it's... But you just did. You just said... There's only one correct way to interpret my own experience. But I could be wrong in what I'm perceiving to be the correct way. 
So I'm not going to, and I'm going to, when people who are wrong, they don't think I'm wrong. They think I'm right, but they are in fact wrong. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I think an, I think an anarchist needs to take my position on this. That's nice. I'm going to be a, an imperialist here. And okay. so, no, no, I mean, I, it doesn't, I just think it's contradictory. I think an anarchist, I think it's, it contra well, it, it contradicts your anarchism. Okay. Not the people who call themselves anarchists. Usually they're okay. totally imperialists and they should be objectivists. Um, Rand was you, not an you're anarchist. You're making a, you're making truth claims, sure. About other people's experiences, about other people's lives. Yes, gladly. So you're saying they're wrong. I think most people are wrong about about their a lot own of, experiences. Oh, of course, you don't think so? No, I want to claim them as autonomous. Oh, honey, no. What? What? It, aren't those are non contradictions. Isn't that isn't isn't that a Randian thing? They autonomy? are autonomous. Individual Doesn't autonomy is not a Randian. Of, a anarchist Individual idea. Individual autonomy principle? is not the same thing as infallibility. What are you talking about? They are free to live their own lives and make their own mistakes. Oh, okay. You will never, you will never seek to impose the correct interpretation on I'm them. I'm not in a position to know it, like Hayek says. I'm not in a position to know for you what is the correct answer. I don't have your background. I haven't walked in your All right. shoes. So I will say that is certainly an improvement over progressivism. Yes. But the basic philosophical position is the same. As Dewey's. No, because mm -hmm. Dewey's one size fits all. His epistemology is the same. I'm not familiar with his epistemology at all. Well, he believes in objective truth. Yeah, but I think he thinks, doesn't he think objective truth is able to be perceived in all cases by everyone? Yes. I don't agree with that. Right. Well, right. I, I think it's... Uh... Hmm. He's part of what Hamilton was against. He thinks all human beings are... Uh, perfectible right so dewey and the progressives believe that there was an object there were many objective truths right some of them moral by the way which right? is insane and i know i know you don't take that position right um and that it was the job of the enlightened right those who knew what the objective truths were right to teach the benighted right what they were right to teach them how to live according to those objective truths. Right. And if they were unable to teach them in a civil way, right. force them right. to live according right. to those objective truths. Right. Whether that was through colonizing the Philippines right. or, inv or invading right. Europe or... Now it's the South. Dropping bombs on Japanese people. Yes. Or, and before that, it was the South. Well, still, exactly. now, now it's the South again. Oh, now, yeah. Because they ran out of places to invade. Yes. But this idea actually started during Reconstruction. Yes. The progressives came out of that. We're going to remake all these people, yes. white and black, in the South. We're going to fix them. In our own image. Yes. White. But but not in, just in a, according to objective truth. Yes. Slavery is objectively bad. Sure. Do you agree with that proposition? Uh, it would depend on the context. Is it ob do you believe in uh, objective ethics? My point is, I can imagine some kind of story where like, I have to be a slave to save my family. Do you know what I mean? Like... Something like that. So to say uh, out of context, slavery is objectively bad. You see what I mean? So you're not a moral absolutist. No. There are not certain things that are bad in all times everywhere. Of course, like, for example, there are many cases where it's appropriate to kill someone. Many. Okay. There's nothing that is always and everywhere bad. I can't. And, and action? I don't know what would be worse than murder. Yeah. Is murder, I don't know, um... Maybe baby rape. rape right? Okay, baby rape. Baby killing, raping and killing a six-month-old is, is that always... I would stop with rape because maybe killing might be appropriate. <laughs> no, no, here's why. What okay. if there's some kind of royal family uh -huh. and if you don't kill that kid, okay. he's going to take over? doesn't matter. So raping a baby, so that is forever and everywhere bad? I, as far as I can think so of. So you, you are a moral absolutist then? Sure. Well, it's important. Well, I don't think, I, I think this it's, is just... It's really important. I, I can't, I mean... Well, think about it. The implications. So that happens. In fact, babies sure. are raped. Yes. In all, all parts of the world. So aren't you obligated then to go fix that? No. To stop that from happening? For example, if someone... If, if it's an absolute evil, a no, universal evil? It's not universal. So if someone has a hostage... And they say, if you don't give me $5,000, I'm going to kill the hostage. That blood's not on your hands if you don't pay the ransom. That's on their hands. It's not my place to stop it. You just said that raping babies is always and forever 
evil. But it's not my place to fight all evil. I don't get why you're not obligated. If you if you make a well, moral claim, obli- aren't you obligated to to address it? No, that's the progressive view. I don't mm. think that's true at all. I think the whole thing with the constrained vision of humanity is that we will always have evil among us. Okay. And unless you acknowledge that this is an essential element of human life, right. you're not you're fucked from the start. I suppose I can live with that. But I do think you're handing progressives their major weapon. If you believe in baby rape, therefore you believe in affirmative action. It's just logic. Yeah. No, I mean it. Okay. Because you're making claims for other people. You are. You're making people you're making claims for people who haven't even lived yet. Okay. Right? You're making a claim that it will be bad then. It would be wrong. It, it was wrong, bad, evil. Not the same. Hmm. Was okay. What? I don't know if it would be bad. It would be wrong. What does that mean? Bad might not have that might not be any actual consequences. Wrong according to morality. <laughs> yeah. So you're making you're making absolute moral claims. Uh, I just, at least I one. one. At yeah. least one. Yeah. I'm sure there's another one if we kept digging. Probably forever. It was it was bad in 500 BC or wrong. Sorry, it was wrong in 500 BC, and it will be wrong in 2080. No. Because in the future, what if you can make babies for the purpose of raping? And then okay, the then you're no, dead, okay right? so now you're no longer a moral absolutist. What if that's like, you now know, I'm, sex dolls. I'm not now, against sex now dolls. Now I like you more again. I'm, I'm wavering with you. Okay. It's going back and forth with you. It's you're been, a mess, aren't you? No, no. You, I'm I, consistent. I, no, I'm not the mess. No, no, no. I, I contradict am, myself and you're all over the place. You're the one raised in a Soviet household, not me. That's true. I'm not, you taught me discipline. No, I was raised in the messiest household possible. Therefore, you're a mess. You were raised in a very controlled household. Therefore, that's I know how, what I'm talking about. We were very different. Oh, by the way, yeah. So that's another big, that's, that's kind of a fundamental difference between us. So yeah, you were raised in this household of control. Yes. Correct? Oh, very much so, okay. yes. And I was raised in a household of neglect. And it you, was a mix of you control probably, and neglect. Oh, I was, I was going to say, you probably envy that about me? No. Uh, I think they'd both be bad in their own way. Yeah, okay, good, yeah. Yeah, I don't even know what I what I think about that. But um, no, my parents. Yeah, so are, you know, people know uh, left wing radicals. At least when I was a kid, and but it doesn't even matter. It, it's that they were in their heads, okay, and interested in other things, big things. You know, Russells. We all are kind of in our heads about stuff. My brother is in his head about Star Wars and <clears throat> fantasy games, and my parents were in their heads about politics and then about psychology. But in their heads, not interested in being parents so i was left to wander the streets you know literally yeah i that and that's probably the source of my anxiety okay i'm guessing so when i read your story it's like i can't relate huh yeah and i don't know what that would do like being in a controlled in, in, in an environment where my parents are always around me and always telling me what to do and always deciding where i should go what it's i not should fun. do yeah, I just don't even know what that would be like, and I can't... It, it's it's uh, like... I, so I used to have dreams when I was a kid, and well into my adulthood, often, of being sort of adopted or brought into a family, like okay. this nice, warm, welcoming family. It's like, that it was literally a dream I had. It was literally my dream, and I kind of organized my life around it, actually. Uh, and I just now started getting over that. Like advanced middle age was hmm. when I started just to th- think, I don't really actually want that. I want more freedom than that. I, I did a, my, my ex, she took a lot of my programming away. It was huh. very useful. Yeah. And because you don't realize how much it's programming. Oh my God. Well, it's mo- most of it is programming. Yeah. 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 Um, it's why I was a socialist. For course. example, like I never ever, you know, we, we'd have these screaming fights and I would never apologize to her. And it got to the point, and I sat down, I thought about this, and I'm like, oh, growing up, if you ever apologized, this would be held over your head for literally decades. So you could never acknowledge it. So like once when I was in high school, I bought my mom Mother's Day flowers the day after Mother's Day, and I still heard about it. And the the other thing is the the Russian mindset's clever. So even if you're not really offended, you have to act like you are because you have that shit that you don't want to give up. So it's all about these power plays. Hmm. So, yeah, oh, so... Talk about how you took the very bold move of you've broken entirely, right, with your family? I talked to my mom. Oh, you do? Yeah. But for a while you didn't? Is that... uh, her, I, I always kept in touch with, yeah. Because I went for like long periods of estrangement. You did? Yeah, like there was a 10-year period. Yeah. Almost 10 years. 
where I didn't speak to my mother at all. Uh, Good for you. Well, yeah. And you tell it to most people and they just think something's wrong with you. And what I tell them, it goes, not everyone's as fortunate enough to have parents like you. And evil sperm is just as, you know, efficacious as regular sperm. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it, it's kind of back to your point. It depends on who your parents were, yeah. right? I mean, I don't know. And I, I still don't know what I should have done when I became an adult and realized what my parents did and did not do to right. me. You right. know, I just, it felt completely out of control. Like I had no choice at the right. time. Yes, exactly. Okay, good. I'm glad you relate to that. Well, very much so. You know, I can't, I can't look at myself 15 years ago and say, oh, you should not have screamed at her on the phone at two in the morning. I mean, I just, there was no, nothing else I could have done. Right. Felt like. Right. Um, I don't know what's, what's happening, but I know it's not working. Do you, is your father still alive? Yes. And you don't talk to him? Correct. Yeah, so, and you're, you're comfortable with that? No. Oh. I wish ah. I could have. My dad has a lot of amazing qualities. Like, amazing. He is extremely... Let me give you two stories about my dad. I was just, um, my sister was just... See, my dad is very, very, very funny, but he's also very, very, very not funny. And I don't understand how someone so smart cannot make the distinction. So my sister was complaining that for a long time, his Facebook profile pic was a sumo wrestler on a ski jump. And he goes, all right. And he just changed it to a photo of her in middle school looking like you know, a socially awkward fat mess. And that was his new profile pic. And she's like, oh, you happy now? And she called him up, his, like freaking out, yelling at him. He's like, well, you wanted me to change it. That's awesome. But he's the same person who also posted a meme of like, this election season, I'm voting for Hillary, voting for Trump, drinking every day, check. It's like, <laughs> that's bumper sticker humor. <laughs> like, you can tell me everything that happened every day of Napoleon's life. You're a brilliant man. And he, you also think... It's just very, very weird. Huh. Uh, but it's hard to communicate with him because he is, again, anytime it's like, look, this is a problem, it's shut up, get a life, or get over it. And it's like, I want to move on with this stuff, but you're not in a... And again, maybe, I don't know why, but I talked to my sister about this. She's like, yeah, he's not capable of giving you what you need. Right. And it's like, when I'm down, I need support and not like, well, you should have known better. And that's 100% what I will get from anyone in my family. It's always twisting the knife because yeah. they think that's a smart approach. Yeah, there's like an authoritarianism in your family. That, I don't that I, that I didn't have. It, it's a it's a don't you dare hope. Huh? Because you're not worthy. I don't. I because nothing good's ever going to happen. Oh. Like for example, I, years ago I met with this agent. I had an agent at the time, and he, the novel I was working on, he's like, I don't think I can sell this. I met with a new agent. He goes, that actually sounds interesting. Let me take a look at it, which is objectively a step forward, right? It's objective fact. I'm like, let me give my dad a chance. He's going to be the first person I call. And he goes, of course he's going to promise you he's going to get it published. That's their job. I go, that's not what he said. And he's like, look, we're in the same position, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, holy, why is it bad that I'm excited that now there's a sliver of hope for this book and that I had a good meeting? Like, what is the harm here? Hmm. A, and first of all, and you don't know what the fuck you're talking about because agents are not going to blow smoke up your ass. It's the exact opposite. It's going to be like, you suck it away. Hmm. Anyone who's done publishing knows that. So not only, and you, he talks about it with this air of authority. It's just like, you don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> and again, this is so contrary to bourgeois wasp culture. Where I they're mean, like encouraging you. Yeah. Think? It's yeah. all, you know, oh, it's great. And you get an award if you just yeah. show up oh, yeah. to baseball practice. Oh, yeah. Uh, I reconnected with him after it, when Eager and Hubris was coming out. Is this? And, well, and I'm like, hey, someone's writing a book about me. He which, goes, oh, I know. So. Wow. So. Fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to even, again, it's hard to relate to that. Um, it's hard for me to relate to it. <laughs> I don't understand that mentality. Yeah. I mean, I've heard, you know, I think that kind of family I, I, <laughs> I've read about um, in... Um, Jewish American literature, like Philip Roth stuff. You kind of read there's families like that in there. And I think, it, you know, it might be um, kind of a Jewish Eastern European immigrant thing. Um, it's that, it, that's what it reminds me of. But I don't like of all the sort of middle and upper class, nice white people I've known, you know, that's rare. You know, and I resent when people think I'm a cynic because I think life is a wonderful, magical adventure. So it kills me, like, and this is the exact opposite approach. It's like, get your head out of the stars. It's like, 
all these wonderful things that happened to me in my life that if I had that approach, it would never, and here's when people ask me for advice about publishing, they're like, Oh, I can never write a book. I never get a book published. Cause when I first started, I read this book by Dennis Johnson called Jesus's son, which is superb. I didn't realize he was a poet and I read it. I'm like, I'm not going to be an author because this guy's amazing. Like I can never do this. And then I realized I don't have to be Dennis Johnson. I just be myself. But when I tell people, I go, look, go to a bookstore and look how, how many terrible, horrible books are published. That could be you. <laughs> aspire to me you could be that crappy writer mm-hmm. and when you put in those terms like you could be mediocre with the book out it's like oh right now it's it's it becomes feasible and you don't have to be steinbeck mm-hmm. yeah i bet you do get called a cynic i it drives me crazy yeah i'm i'm the complete opposite i can see why people think yeah. that about you because um, anyone because who- well you are a cynic in politics see this is the thing right well i think you are cynical about politics I, I don't. Which is a, which is see, a great, c- technically, cynicism is thinking people will, are always motivated by the worst. Where I don't know if it's the people or the system that forces them to act that way. Yeah, or I mean, you're just not. There's no sentiment. You're not no, no sentimentality about oh, politics. So right? one of my favorite. Well, no. So William Graham Sumner, who was one of the early social Darwinists, taught at taught mm-hmm. at Yale. Yeah. He, one of the most profound things ever written he's what he said is what he's against is the sentimental philosophy yeah and what he described it as is the idea that things which aren't or shouldn't be true therefore which things that shouldn't be true therefore aren't true yeah yeah and that's what Rand would talk about primacy of consciousness over primacy of existence yeah and you're relentlessly skeptical too yes yes which people confuse that with with a particular kind of cynicism right or a, a darkness and a or, dark sense of humor also yeah, they yeah, confuse yeah. Cynicism. Um, yes. but my god i mean i think if you're not cynical in that way about politics right we're, we're toast these are people comfortable sending we children to war are done what are you talking about we're dead i'm telling you it's the most dangerous thing yes to not be cynical yes about politics you must be relentlessly it's amazing how people skeptical. understand with a straight face with a straight face that men who are in positions of power get along, get away with treating women yeah. in horrible, horrible ways, including kind of this acquaintance rape, and never are called to task for it because he's the glad hander, and Bill Clinton could never have done these things. He's exactly the kind of person who'd do it and get away with it. Mm-hmm. Like, why is, how can you, oh, yeah. well, how I mean, this, can I put these two things together? And of They're course, all, this is the entire Obama pre- presidency, right? right? I mean, that, that's the entire thing. Right. Uh, because he's fundamentally a good person. Right. And you know this because you so, see him on TV. You know, what the fuck are you talking about? You've never met him. So when he kills people, it's it's a mistake. We're angry with him even. Or necessary. Or necessary. But, you know, right. often they'll say, you know, they're not happy with this at right. all. Right. They're oh, quite yeah. cross with him yeah. about, you know, droning the babies right. in Yemen. Yeah. But it's it's different, right? It's right. it's it's a mistake by a good person. I wrote an article about this for the Observer that said or weakness, or might you know he may not be strong enough. That's right. I love that how it's like Obama's not strong enough to stand up against the military industrial right. complex or stand up to the Republicans. I'm like, no, no, no. He's standing up pretty much where he has always stood. Well, in his defense, I don't know if when you become president, they don't sit you down. And they go, that's great that you won the election, but here's how it's going to be. I mean, that's certainly plausible to me. And frankly, I know that's a bad thing because if there's that sense of continuity. He's an establishment person from birth. Did you know that both of his parents worked for the CIA? I did not know that. Yeah, I wrote a piece for Reason years ago um, about Obama's early biography and found that out. Holy crap. They were both funded by the CIA. Wow. Definitely. Um, His father, that's how they met. His father was flown to the East West Center in Hawaii some kind of fellowship, but there was a CIA. He was part of a, he was a member of a party in Kenya that was funded by the CIA at the time. And his fellowship was funded by the CIA or a foundation was laundered through some foundation. And his mother, if you look at her career, it's all these academic grants from the Ford foundation and all these other CIA fronts. He's a, he's literally a child of the CIA. They met at that school. It was the East West center is a CIA school in Honolulu. It is. I mean, that's not even debated, but like, yeah, when I found and when I did the research on this, I was like, "Why is no one talking about this?" Right, I'm because shocked. at the time it was a review. Not even Alex Jones. Well, oh man, <laughs> oh god, it is kind of un- very unfortunate, right? That, that one of the first people to be interested in renegade history was Glenn Beck. Oh, um, for the wrong reasons. Well, I mean, you know, but he's got his heart in his right place. He so, feels a lot of guilt for the Iraq so stuff. They both. I mean, God, please don't ever take this out of context. Whoever's listening, but. You know, Alex Jones and Glenn Beck, when they talk about particular things in regards to progressivism and the history of it, in, in fact, are right occasionally about that stuff. But um, uh, 
What was I saying? Obama, CIA, establishment. Good no talking about oh, this. oh, right. So the, the conservative line on him, of course, has always been that he's like not American. Right. Fundamentally, not just the birthers, but, you know, that he's just that he's hostile to American right. values and traditions. And it's the exact opposite. Actually, he embraced it. He's an assimilationist at his core. And look at the family. Look at Michelle and Barack. And the, I mean, is, that is the American nuclear family sitting under a Christmas she, tree. She is like a golem of progressivism. This is their, their whole idea of this magical Negro perfect. thing. Perfect. Yes. That they could have built him. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, I know. I've always said that. He's you know dark enough that it's like he's not white, but light enough that they're not threatened. Yeah. The only time I've ever been um, disciplined by a college administration was when I called Obama white. Wait, what about when you were talking about how slavery wasn't that bad? That was when they fired me. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. This is, no, I, uh, when he was, it was during the election, the first election, 2008, I was doing a class on race at the new school right down the street from where we're sitting. Or not far from where we're sitting. Um, and um, I laid out all the sort of, you know, values of white Protestantism, you know, Americanism and... One, two, three, Protestant work ethic, nuclear family ethic, modesty, humility, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and I said, you know, and now let's do Obama, like in terms of his personal characteristics and his political values, you know, what is he? One, two, three, check, 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 check. Perfect score. And I said, therefore, and this was after I developed this whole argument, how these values had been associated with whiteness, yes. right? And they all, all the students at Lefty New School were like, oh, totally, absolutely agreed with that. And I said, well, then Obama's white. Right. I had one student who was uh, a young black woman who was from Honolulu yeah. <laughs> who started crying. And that night I got an email mm. from the dean of the college saying she needed to meet with me. And so I show up at her office. She's the dean of the, Eugene Lang, it was Eugene Lang, the undergraduate. And she's there. She's a pretty prominent scholar. And with her is the dean of students who's about a six foot, four inch, probably 250 pound Jamaican guy. Okay. <clears throat> and he told me that this student was very upset and he wanted to quote, make sure nothing like this ever happened again. By throwing her in a volcano, hopefully. And I, <laughs> in her native Honolulu. <laughs> well, I don't blame her. I mean, I don't, I tend not to be mad at the students about these things, but oh, well. I said, are you telling me what I can say in my classroom? Yeah. And he, did you say bitch, please? And he backed right down. Oh, did he really? Oh yeah. I'm sh that I'm shocked. Yeah. Because no. he's in a position to tell you. Mm -mm. There's this thing called academic freedom, and there's also... Uh, that, they called, actually believe in that? There's also faculty governance, so we actually, there is sort of a division of power. Oh, I, didn't, power. Know, I yeah, didn't realize that, okay. Universities, and I actually think it's a bad thing generally, okay. but in this case, it served my purposes. Yeah, no, faculty are basically given autonomy over curriculum. Well, one of the points that you're kind of getting into is something I've I'm, I'm kind of been talking about in my writing, and I know you touch on this too, is that... You know, I always say progressivism is Christianity without the mythology. Yeah, let's do this. So one of the big uh, schisms, I don't know how the word's pronounced, between Protestants and Catholics was about transubstanti transubstantiation, meaning when you take that communion wafer and you drink the communion wine, does it literally mm -hmm. become Christ's bones and blood? Mm -hmm. And to Catholics, the cracker literally, wafer, excuse me, literally becomes bones and the wine literally becomes blood. It doesn't taste like blood, doesn't look like blood, doesn't have, weigh the same amount of blood, but this is one, one, what they call one of the mysteries of the church, which is when things are just so nonsensical they can't even think of a reason for it. For, Protest for progressives, they have the same thing. Clarence Thomas is literally not black. Bill Clinton literally is, and they people can't wrap their heads around it. That is exactly the same religious impulse, that it doesn't matter what is physically true. What matters is it's a spiritual state. And you see so many progressives saying, oh, I wish I was black or implying it. They mean a kind of spiritual um, salvation from which their whiteness is a flaw. And I, I forget, I think it was W.E.B. Du Bois or, or one of the, these like 1930s writers who said, I am sick and tired of being a method of salvation for white people. Hmm. But instead of Christ, they view it, it, it used to be the working class and it was black people, gay people. It changes throughout time. But someone else is there suffering is their cure of their original sin it is remarkable <laughs> to watch them do this joan walsh of salon yeah. she's probably the oh yeah biggest practitioner of this um right now um they use black people to find their own salvation right talk about lacking autonomy like right how are they saved 
they are they are saved by what well, you had this great Facebook quote. I I I it was beautiful. You go nothing makes college educated whites as ecstatic as the opportunity to help a black person. Oh yeah yeah yeah. And it, oh right okay, yeah. yeah. So that is how it's like. Oh my God, I'm doing something for black people. I'm the greatest person ever. It's like some of us from Brooklyn like black people and in, and don't see them as some kind of alien who's a means to an end. Right. Or the ma- then they're also the magic Negro that right. they are perfect. Right. And always right. Yeah. Um, so let's finish by talking about, and this is something I think about a lot, what it's like, and I've actually heard you talk about this elsewhere, what it's like to be not just a political person, political thinker, mm-hmm. intellectual in American culture, which is alienating enough, but to be, you know, a radical, iconoclastic, anarchist, intellectual in New York City. It's actually... What, I mean, what's life like? It's actually a lot easier than you think. So I remember when I was in elementary school and I was reading Greek myths and we were being taught the Old Testament at school and I was scared to bring in these books of Greek myths because I thought people at school would think I believed in this. My dad's like, no, 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 they won't think that. I go, how is this conceptually different from the Noah stories? It, it, if anything, Hercules makes more sense than Noah. And I remember, I, don't, I remember I was reading, you know, I'd go to the library all the time and I'd read all these books and there are always characters named Mary and I never knew anyone named Mary. I thought that was very odd. And then I must have been somewhere be- before the age of 10 is when I first heard the story of Christ and the virgin birth. First of all, the idea in Judaism that God, who is this infinite beyond comprehension force, is going to be walking around the Middle East in sandals. It, it, it's I can't even tell you how nonsensical it sounds. Mm-hmm. As, as a kid, you're being taught about God, you know, being this pervasive, awe-inspiring force. The idea that like she's a virgin and she has a kid, and that people believe this, and not only people, like 90% of people in your country believe this. I was like, holy crap, that really taught me to be very, like, a, a huge numbers of people can think things that are beyond ridiculous. So that is, has been my position ever since. So being an anarchist, like, I was just out with my friend Courtney. She's like, oh, you don't have a horse in the race. I'm like, no, I know it's going to be bad no matter who's in charge. And I'm capable of empathizing with different points of view and understanding where they come from. So I don't have any issue with anyone unless they don't have a sense of humor about it. Like, I get why many people are, I have no problems with people who are liberals, meaning they think we need a safety net, you know, we should help the weak. I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're not an evangelical of either strife, one, I'm very close friends with this family in the Midwest. They're all, you know, born again Christians. They're great. The Matt Hughes family? The Matt Hughes family, yeah. yeah they're UFC wonderful, fighter? UFC, yeah. wonderful, wonderful people, beyond wonderful. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. I'm not interested in changing their point. We have talk politics all the time. Mm-hmm. I get where they're coming from, and more power to them. Matt found Christ and became a better husband and father. How the hell am I going to say, no, you're wrong? You know, I can't argue with, with results. So it's not hard at all. People know that I'm not a uh, hate monger other than for humorous purposes. So I get along with everyone. It's actually pretty easy. Yeah, but it's such an important part of your life, isn't it? Politics? Yeah, yeah of okay. course. So that's my problem is that it's, it's not all of who I am, but it's a, obviously a major part of, of, of who I am. Sure. And I feel like I can't really talk about it with people who are, I'm actually close to. Oh. So I talk all day long with people, you know, I'm not friends with about politics and that's fine. And with my students and that's fine. But it's hard it being a guy from Berkeley. Okay. <laughs> who has been, who live, who has lived in New York city, Los Angeles and Portland, Oregon right. and been in and around colleges and universities my entire adult life. Right. Uh, to talk about politics. With people I actually know. I, I, I almost never do. Like personally. Yeah, I almost never do. And, you know, most of the time I can do that. I can separate those things and be more or less comfortable. But it seems like it's gotten worse lately. Maybe it's just because of the election. But I feel often like I am carrying some dirty secret. Like I feel tainted. Like if they find out what I think about things... They'll, and it's true. This is true. If they find out what you, Michael, think about Medicaid, <laughs> right? I, I, they will think. I, I'm I'm speaking for them. So. Oh, your friends. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No. And okay. you're well, probably a lot of your friends too. No. Well, a lot of people in New York City, where you live, for sure, yeah, will think you're a bad person. I don't care about the moral. But you know that you agree with that, right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. But they're beneath me. 
<laughs> I'm quite serious. Well, no, that's good. I mean, I'm glad you, and I, I mean this, I'm really, if you can, great that you feel if that you way, can dismiss it's just hard for me to, if you can dismiss someone who's smarter than you within 10 seconds based on one position, you're shit. The problem is that's everyone I know. <laughs> oh, that is a problem. <laughs> not everyone, but it's, it's, it's certainly dominant. That is the, do, that is the typical person in my, I, world. I that's a, the typical person in my world for I sure. I have a big crew and I roll deep, so it's not that way for me. And I'm very fortunate. Very, very How do you, fortunate. Where do you find these people? Um, word of mouth, social media. Huh. Um, there's a lot. And of they, these are not people of your politics. These are people who have all kinds of different yeah. political ideas. I've got people all over the map and I can pick their brains about stuff because they know I'm not coming from it from some, like, let's, let's suppose that they're left wing. They know I'm not coming at this from some Christian conservative homophobia place. Really? So you hang out with like bona fide left wingers in, yes. in Brooklyn and they're cool. Yes. With you. Yes. They don't think that you... And they're cool, period. They don't think you lack compassion and are, no. there's something really wrong with you? Well, th everyone thinks there's something really wrong with me, but well, it's no, kind but of a tongue-in-cheek, yeah. They, know, they recognize that I'm smart and that I'm not giving um, cliched little sound bites. So they're, even if they don't get it, at least they're not going to be like, all right, this guy's just some kind of stupid quasi-fascist. Maybe I'm just paranoid, but it, you know, because it's not like everyone... Well, I have had people tell this to me, you know, that I don't care about people. That's why I think this or that. Um, but it sure, it sure seems like, I mean, you hear it all the time, right? People who say something about politics that matches what you, you or I would say are called, you know, um, morally inferior and, you know, they lack compassion or, you know, there's something, there's something wrong with them. Right. They really lack some humanity. Like that right. tweet I sent you the yes, other day, yes. right? That woman, whoever, she's like a young adult novelist. Okay. Yeah. Who said, the problem I have in all these debates about Obamacare is I can't convince you to care about other people. Right. <laughs> it's like they start with that assumption. Right. But right. people like that I'd never be friends with. Yeah. So your thing is, yes, that's most people, but I just don't hang with them. So it's yeah. not an issue. In fact, usually when I meet someone, I throw out an, a quasi obnoxious comment because their improv reaction so is you're gonna, testing them. Yes, it's yeah, right. Right. Litmus test. Correct. Which is good. No. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I guess it's that. I mean, Brooklyn is obviously bad, but then again, you are these people like in like Brownstone, Brooklyn? No, ew, God, no. Yeah, right. Okay. See, that's, the, yeah. I just live in the wrong places. I think it's also that I've, being on television mm -hmm. and being an author, and you know, I worked with D.L. Hughley in his two books. He's very left, and I agree with a lot of what he talks about because I'm socially very left. I think that I'm kind of all over the place in many ways. People are much more comfortable than that if I were, let's say, like some kind of Laura Ingram figure. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, you also know I cover RuPaul's Drag Race for the Observer. So culturally, <laughs> I'm very, very left wing. I'm a punk. Um, so I get along pretty. The people I can't get along with are the upper class college whites. Yeah. And when I see them and th their affect, yeah, it's just like you're disgusting to me, yeah. and I don't need to talk to you. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. Isn't RuPaul's Drag Race the greatest television show? I sit in, there in history. We're talking about how conservatism is slow motion progressivism. So all the little quotes in that show are going to be on Fox in like seven years. So I'm sitting there taking notes. I've got all the great burns when I'm on air and everyone's like, how do you come up with this stuff? I'm like, I didn't. I stole that from Jaden Dior Fierce, you know, yeah, stuff I, like that. It's I amazing. Love, yeah. I don't know RuPaul, but I know the guys who make that show. Right. Um, RuPaul has performed in blackface. Yeah. RuPaul I know. Has, he's, has, he's has worn greatest. a Confederate flag dress. He's the greatest. He's the greatest. He is the greatest. He is the greatest American alive, I think, right now. Second. Well, after Michael Malice, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, he's amazing. And, you know, he the whole pronoun thing, he doesn't give a shit. Well, he got in people, trouble for it. I know. the whole yeah. And the whole tranny thing. Yes. He doesn't care. And it's... it's you it's know what his great tweet was? Racism is boring, uh, almost as boring as pointing out racism. Or I got those two mixed yeah. up. It's like, exactly. It's like, he doesn't... I don't, think, I don't know if he ever articulated this, but he, he basically is saying, why, you know, getting so upset about some random person and their ideas about who you are, or what you are is doing nothing but giving them power. He has, this, you're, this, you're, all you're doing is, uh, perpetuating this hierarchy. You're saying what they think matters. The song lyric is unless they pay your bills, pay the bitches. Exactly. No mind. It's not exactly right. I know it's the greatest attitude. So that's, you, it's a big world. You can disagree with me. Go live your best life. I will wish you nothing but good things. I don't care about and your. By opinion. the way, this civil war between dra the drag queens and the new trans people yes. is is very important, and we're losing. Like my team, the I don't drag think queens. I don't think they are. 
it seems you like can't beat the drag I'm queens. worried. I nope. mean, it, <sighs> there is so much talent there. Did you see? There was this guy who got Bianca Del Rio won season seven. She's a great insult comic. A guy got up, not realizing she's half Colombian, half Ecuadorian, or whatever. And was your, your jokes are racist? You shouldn't be, uh, and the, you know, screw you from the Hispanic, you, the, screw you from the Hispanic community who pays your bills. And Bianca goes, the Hispanic community should pay their own bills. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, I interviewed her. She's giving me Anne Frank jokes. It was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, black stand-up comedians and black and Latina <laughs> drag queens. Those are my heroes and my models. Yes. Yep. Little Richard invented rock. Absolutely. Uh, so I don't need to give up politics. I just need to like move to a different neighborhood. You got to be more in, into social media. I'm all over social media. No, I, I don't. Are you interacting with people? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. No, I have lots of, con- no, that's all fulfilling and fine. I mean, I pro- have, then you probably have to move. I get to talk about politics all day long. Yeah. It's just with people who are not sitting next to me. Yeah. Right. It's a, yeah. Um, when I walk and the thing is I literally work on a college campus. Okay. You know, and it's, that's just yeah, a nightmare. So I, you know, I'm, as people know, I'm working on ways to liberate myself right. from that. Um, and I hope that happens. But until then, you know, that's who I'm surrounded by Ugh. in terms of physical proximity. Yeah. It must and be and, like, and more importantly, people who control yes. my world, who have power, actual yeah. institutional power. What's the worst? They do. So I actually have to worry about that. It's Kafka. I actually do have to worry about what they think about yep. me. So I have to be guarded. It's awful. Now you know what it's like to be in a Soviet household. I, <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's there, exactly what it's like. No, that's exactly what I just Knowing, thought. That's right. Yeah. Any one of these people has the arbitrary ability to hurt you at any time uh, based on whatever they feel like it and then never have to feel guilt or accountability. They'll be self-righteous about it. My family wasn't like that, but they taught me that's what, it, that's what living in Soviet Russia is like. So you always have to kind of bite your tongue and be aware of who has power over you at every time. Hopefully one day I will be able to liberate myself from that world the way that you oh, liberated great. yourself oh, from great. your world. Oh, it's so great. It's the best thing ever. And with that, I think we're good. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. Our theme music was composed by Clint Parti, and our sound engineer is Gabriel Montgomery. If you have any questions you'd like me to answer on the podcast, post them to me at my Twitter handle, at Thaddeus Russell. Also, be sure to check out notes and links for each episode at ThaddeusRussell.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening.